Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to The Realignment. Let's be quick about this. We've got an excellent episode featuring Sebastian Malaby. He was mentioned in our episode of Christopher Leonard. He's written a book on the Fed. He's written a book on hedge funds and Wall Street. And now he's just released a new book on venture capital. The book is called The Power Law, Venture Capital and the Making of the New Future. Sagar and I are incredibly interested in the venture capital industry. We didn't know much about it before we started the show. And this is a really interesting corrective on a lot of the discourse around Silicon Valley and tech. We're going to cover a lot of really interesting things here. VC, how it works, why it matters, how it could or could not shape progress, how funding new companies could actually serve to push back against the power of big tech and the big debate in China and the US on how the industry should be regulated. So lots of great stuff here. It's going to get a bit wonky, but that's what we all know and love here. Let's get into the episode. Sebastian Malabé, welcome to The Realignment. Yeah, good to be with you. I'm really excited that we're speaking with you this week. We recently had Christopher Leonard on the show, and he randomly brought up your book, The Man Who Knew About the Federal Reserve, as one of the few readable, from a popular audience perspective, books on the topic. So I was really glad to note that we had a recording with you that next week. So looking back at your work, you have The Man Who Knew, more money than God, which is about hedge funds. You've now added Silicon Valley and venture capital to this economic pantheon. What would you say, just taking a step back for a second, the big, broad economic story you've basically been telling for the past 10 or so years is? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you're right that my um, last three books, including the one that's about to come out, uh, are different slices of economic history and financial history, roughly running the same period from like 1960 to today. Um, and I'm doing different verticals within that. So as you said, hedge funds, that's about public investing. How do you outsmart the stock market? Then there's uh, the biography of Alan Greenspan, which is about how do you regulate finance? How do you, you know, what's it like from a public policy perspective? And now, Technology investing in Silicon Valley, my new book. Um, it's different slices of finance. It covers the same period. And if you ask me, so what's the big sort of united theme? It's really the way that finance has grown and, you know, for, for good and for ill, become so dominant in modern society, such that, you know, the way the finance goes is often the way the real economy goes and therefore the way society goes. And so if you think about tech investing right now, we have this just enormous profusion of new technologies, which results in social change and disruption and dislocation, and that has psychological impacts on folks. And it really all starts with venture capital. Um, so I think, you know, in different ways, finance has risen to be a prominent part of our lives. So let's start simply then what exactly is venture capital and why is it specifically important to the story you're telling here then? Yeah, those are great questions because venture capital is weird. I mean, it's not like other kinds of finance um, in the sense that you go to business school, you learn about investing. The first thing you might hear is that you're supposed to discount the future cash flow uh, of, of an equity or a bond or whatever it is you're buying. Well, when you do early stage venture capital, um, there are two-legged mammals who walk into your office with a dream, right? There's, there's no cash flow, there's no market, there's no product, there's nothing. Uh, there's just a vision. Uh, and so none of the quantitative techniques that you might learn in business school apply. So what is venture capital? It's a way of coming at the world that is really different to how everybody else comes at it, which tolerates enormous risk because most startups do fail and yet is willing to kind of believe that a few of these startups will do so well that they will justify the losses that you make elsewhere. And therefore, it's the right thing to provide capital to people who don't have any collateral. All they've got is ideas, right? Um, I, I call the book The Power Law because it's this skewed distribution of outcomes, um, the way that if you make 10 bets, one of them will be hopefully a grand slam and that will make back all the money plus some that you lost on all the other bets, right? Um, that power law idea is really the secret source of venture capital. 
And how, there are a couple of illustrations of this in the book, but how would the power law idea manifest itself in other uh, parts of the real world? Well, you know, um, it's a cool title, I think, although it's an obscure title to many people, but I, <laughs> I stuck with it despite friends of mine saying, what do you mean, the power law? What, what, you know? um, I stuck with it because the power law does operate on so many different levels. As you say, in the natural world, it could be that 80% of the people live in 20% of the cities. It probably is the case that 80% of the academic citations accrue to 20% of the papers. And by the way, when I say 80-20, I mean, it's often called the 80-20 rule, but it's actually probably that 90% uh, of the citations might accrue to the top 10% of the papers. You know, it's not precise 80-20. But the, the point is that in some areas of life, success begets success. So when things start to take off, like a paper by a particular professor gets to be recognized, so people are talking about it, people are writing about it, then more people hear about it, the word of mouth effect spreads, and you get this feedback loop where it becomes more and more successful. That's the power law at work, this exponential takeoff. And that is at the core of um, the way that tech startups you know, most fail, but some of them really take off. It's also at the core of the way that in venture capital investment firms, some of them capture almost all of the total gains, right? So that the best ones uh, walk away with whatever, 80% of the total profits. Uh, and so the power law is operating at multiple levels. Uh, and I think, I hope, I hope uh, that once people get that, they'll say, ah, the power law, that's the secret source. I want to learn about that. And uh, and so my title will work out. Yeah, we'll do our best to make that work here. Something we were wondering here is where does the logic of the power law end? In the sense that why not, and this isn't quite the perfect real world metaphor, but why not just invest money in every single startup? In the sense that people often compare investing in a startup, like you said, to baseball, in the sense that you're going for the grand slams. But unlike in baseball, there's no technically there's no technical limit. There's no strikeout. There's no, there's no, there's no walking. So where does this logic really end when it comes to the limiting factors when it comes to investing capital in this sense? Well, you could strike out if you made 10 bets and none of them succeeded, uh, you would be down to zero in your in your fund and you wouldn't raise a second fund because people wouldn't believe you anymore. So I don't think that there's no limit. I think what, what, what is true, though, is that it's, it's tough intuitively, it's tough to intuit the limit, right? It just your expression, your, your question does express, I think, a legitimate kind of head scratching, right? Which I shared as well when I was beginning. Um, but I think the truth is that even when you have very asymmetric bets, which are either going to go to zero or they're going to go almost to infinity, you can still apply intelligence and method and technique to those bets. And it's not just a lottery. Uh, and in fact, that in a way is the animating intellectual mystery that I'm trying to solve as I write this story of venture capital. It's like, how do you make those bets thoughtfully? Uh, because there's all these anecdotes, you go to Silicon Valley, you hear all these stories about, well, yeah, you know, I raised money from this venture capitalist because he happened to like my bike and he was into cycling and we got talking about cycling and then we clicked together and then he invested. Yeah, right. You know, that sounds just like rubbish. Uh, but there are tons of those stories in Silicon Valley. And my job as an investigative writer was to kind of find the, the signal in the noise, you know, the method in the madness. Uh, and I hope that's what I've done. Yeah, something... If it's interesting what your book coming out at this point in 2022 is that it seems that we're slowly but surely moving into a market where capital raising is democratizing. You're seeing the SEC slowly but surely relax the requirements to prevent retail investors from investing in startups. You're seeing crowdfunding alternate models. If you're a person who's into Web3, you could say, hey, my decentralized autonomous organization is raising money in a non-traditional way. So given all of that, what would you say the news you can use section for listeners would be? Which is, if there was ever a point where I could say, you can experience the wonders of investing in startups or technology, it seems that we're as close to that as we ever have been. How, how much of the idea of the power law is really restrained to big institutions with LPs who raise 
hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars? What's the real uh, dichotomy there? I think, you know, there are ways that um, individuals can break into this space. In fact, the idea of the solo venture capitalist um, is gaining traction, uh, you know, at the moment, if you follow venture capital Twitter, for example, you get a lot of talk about solo (laughs) solo VCs. Um, So people do break in. um, And also on the other side of the equation, you've got the entrepreneurs. And this is a great time to be an entrepreneur because there's so much money flooding through the system looking for deals. And if an entrepreneur has a good idea, they're going to raise money. So that gets gets to the point here, which is that at a core level in the year 2022, what does a venture capital firm actually bring to the table? Because obviously, it's incredibly difficult to raise money for a business or an idea. But if you follow venture capital Twitter, so if you're focused on that top 1% or even that top 0.01%, it seems like if you have one of those companies, there is so much money that is sloshing around and interested in you and your idea within that type of competitive market where money is almost a commodity to a certain degree, how do the firms differentiate themselves? Yeah, you have to prove that your dollar is greener than the other investor's dollar, right? Uh, And the way you do that is you offer services and advice uh, and connections that are kind of bundled in with the investment. So the deal is, you know, take my money because me and also my partners at my firm are going to help you do something you're going to find it difficult to do otherwise. And that could be, you know, we have partners who understand go-to-market strategy. You know, our operating partner over here ran um, the rollout for some super successful cloud software product. That's what you're trying to build. So if you could have this person's advice, it's going to really make a difference. Or it could be that, you know, we have a fantastic recruiter for talent and we're going to find you your first five engineers. Or it could be that, you know, hey, you want to break into the Asian market? Well, we have connections in Japan and China. Um, There's a bunch of different ways in which investors offer to add value, um, but you do have to add value. And what's interesting here is this is where you're raising of the topic of the solo entrepreneur becomes interesting because you just described what a firm like A16Z would say. They have services, they have resources, in many ways they're a media company, but you also have oftentimes they're they're writers or content creators. You have people actually raising solo funds. What is the argument that they are making when they are competing against a big firm with hundreds and hundreds of people? Who can help your startup and focus there? Like, what's the what's the differentiation from the solo practitioner perspective? Well, the argument is that you know you like me. I'm good. If you take my money, it'll be me. It won't be some other member of the team behind me who you haven't met, and they might be mediocre. Um, so that's the trade off for the entrepreneur. Do you want sort of the one person that you've bonded with and you like, or do you want the idea of a big institution like Andreessen Horowitz behind you? So let's let's get to the topic of the future, which is also in the the book's title. You you spoke with a VC who essentially said the future can't be predicted; it can only be discovered. Given the vast amount of interviews and discussions you held for this book, what would you say the future in quotation marks? What is that future that's being discovered right now? Oh well, that's a great question. I think there are probably I'd say three avenues that kind of spring to mind, right? One is um, pharmaceutical development, I think is pretty super exciting right now. And um, that is increasingly a venture capital backed uh, segment. Um, So if you look at the Moderna vaccine for coronavirus, for example, that was um, from a company that was backed by a VC. um, And the um, technology uh, behind these uh, new types of uh, coronavirus vaccine, both the Pfizer and Moderna, is a technology that, as you know, can be repurposed to other kinds of new drug developments. So I think the combination of gene sequencing, you know, maybe 20 years ago, on top of that, CRISPR, gene editing, on top of that, all these other new techniques that are coming down the pike, these are not sort of specific product innovations. They are kind of category tool innovations that that give you a platform as a pharmaceutical developer 
to really go out and take take on new challenges. So that's a super exciting area. I'd say a second is AI. I mean, it's pretty obvious that that's already happening. Um, whether you call it big data or AI, you know, the lines kind of blur between. But um, I think, you know, if one was to say, you know, um, general AI, uh, artificial general intelligence, AGI, I guess it's called, there's a debate there about the singularity and whether that's going to happen anytime soon. But what is not a debate is that specific tasks are being increasingly done by AI. And that's all over the place in our iPhones or whatever. And, and that's a super exciting area. And then, of course, there's Web3. Um, and Web3, I think, is incredibly intriguing. Um, I suspect that there's an enormous amount of nonsense in that space. But when you see this much talent and this much capital and this much energy flow into some area like that, something is going to work. So I kind of think we are at you know, that point, like in 1994 with the internet, before Netscape had come along. Um, and we don't have the killer app that makes a product go from a, a sort of niche band of enthusiasts to being totally mainstream. But I believe that it will come. And uh, whatever shape that takes is, is going to be transformative. And we'll get to Web3 a little bit later in the show because the broader discourse, like you said, this early is actually very revealing of a lot of the trends and the factors are focused on there too. So I want to put a quick bookmark on that. But let's get to actually a core part of your argument here, which is essentially that you believe and demonstrate that venture capital is actually a key driver of progress itself. And because the industry itself is a little confusing, it's purposefully opaque, that isn't immediately clear. And we need to factor in this conversation when we're discussing a backlash against technology. So could make the case for why venture capital itself is a peer driver of progress. Because the one thing I worry out here too is that you often hear the joke people make that, you know, the greatest minds of our generation didn't go into hard science. They didn't go into building in the real world. They went into advertising technology and they went into addicting us all to our mobile phones. That's basically the counterpoint to the progress argument. So what, what is the progress argument? Yeah, again, there's a lot to unpack there and it's a great question. I mean, you know, I think part of the progress argument is that it's pretty tough ever to get a consensus on what progress sort of ought to be, right? So People will say, gee, you know, too much effort goes into ad tech. Why can't you put some of that venture capital into clean tech? Of course, there is now more and more money going into clean tech and it's doing quite well. Uh, but shouldn't there be even more? And, and, and who needs this ad tech anyway? And I think there's, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion about what is socially useful and whether ad tech is used socially useful. But I mean, the way we organize ourselves as a society is that we allow decentralized decisions where different people decide to do different stuff. And if there's a market for what they do and people are paying for what they do, it suggests there must be presumably some value in that. And you might say, well, I don't think there is, but then, I mean, what about all those people designing buttons for designer shirts in Milan? I mean, do we need more buttons for shirts? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, maybe it makes some people happy, but maybe it's just you know frivolous. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to have objective criteria for what we regard as useful innovation. So we, what we have is price signals, and clearly venture capital and tech companies are definitely responding to price signals. And you know I could play out the ad tech uh, story a little bit. I mean it happens to be the case that um, my sister works for or is a co-founder of a, a little startup in the UK, and um, it's kind of like a, a way of listing the cafes and other venues that you happen to like. And the way she's grown the business is that she's used social media targeted ads to bring awareness to her product and to try to, you know, therefore bring awareness to the little independent cafes that she's highlighting. Now, you know, put like that, it's a small business. It's like local cafes. It's your high street. It's your community. Maybe that's good. And uh, when Facebook recently changed its algorithm to allow more privacy, by the way, <laughs> that really messed up my sister's growth metrics. So, you know, that's just one little story behind the way that um, 
what we think of as Facebook and ad tech and maybe the less attractive side of tech, uh, and I too am sort of a critic of Facebook, um, you know, actually you know, there can be upsides that we, we don't recognize. What is the difference between investing in hardware? So Apple leads to the iPhone and investing in more ephemeral software technologies, because I think this is also where the argument around progress, yay or nay, really comes down to. Absolutely. So that's right. So, I mean, clearly we've been in a period since really the arrival of the internet, um, let's date it to the Netscape flotation in 1995, when, as Mark Andreessen said, you know, software is eating the world. Software companies have proven to be incredible growth stories. And so now you've got all these tech behemoths, um, which are not entirely only software, but they're mostly software, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's you know, Facebook, whether it, Google is pretty much a pure software play. Apple is a mixture, um, but, but you know, software really predominates. Um, and that's led people to think, well, why don't you do more hardware and maybe venture capital cannot even back hardware because it takes too much capital investment um, to build the factory you need to make the hardware. And these venture guys are kind of cheap and lazy and they just want to give a little bit of money and back a bit of software and then they want to get rich and happy on that. But that ignores the prehistory or the earlier history of what VCs did. I mean, in the first part of my book, I talk about the origins of Silicon Valley, the origins of venture capital. And there you've got stories like Fairchild Semiconductor, you've got Apple Computer being backed by VCs. Uh, you know, you've got uh, Genentech, the first biotech company, Tandem Computers, Compaq, all right? And so all of these, these were, these were all hardware stories. Even UUNet, which is now a forgotten name, but it's kind of a cool story about the building of the routers and the pipes that made the internet possible, that was a VC-backed hardware company. So, um, you know, VC absolutely can do hardware. I know lots of VC partnerships that almost only do hardware, uh, and they do, you know, medical robotics, or they do, you know, experimental um, satellite companies, or, you know, batteries for electric vehicles. Um, and so there is hardware, it can be done, but I think the twist is, that the venture capitalist needs to be willing to ask for uh, a bigger share of the company for a given amount of capital, because it does take longer to build hardware. The risks, therefore, are bigger. More capital is going to be needed. Um, and so the, the deal terms between the entrepreneur and the VC will look a bit different than it does in software. This is an interesting point because it goes to the history you're telling here, which is honestly really fun. If you think of, think of Netscape. Right. So um, was it uh, Jim Barksdale? Did he co? Yeah. So Jim Barksdale um, co founds Netscape with Mark Andreessen. So this is the first internet browser. And, you know, the previous company that Jim Barksdale had founded was Silicon Graphics. And this, this, you know, this creates, this helps create Toy Story, all this technology is there. But notoriously, Jim Barksdale did not make that much money from founding Silicon Graphics because VCs invested in the hardware and the more tech part of that and they owned up, took took up more and more and more of the company. So to to what so it seems as if that early part of the Silicon Valley story with VCs as these rapacious vultures who are taking things from founders that led us to a point where in basically 2008 plus things are more centered on founders, which is, this is about, and actually, you know, famously, obviously, uh, uh, Steve Jobs is kicked out of Apple. He doesn't control the company that he founds um, very early on. So to what degree, it seems like we swung from the 1990s VCs control everything to the 2010s. It's all about the founders. They have not only total control narratively, but they actually have super voting shares that give them more power over just an average investor. Where are we on that narrative right now? Because it seems like we're swinging between the two directions. Yeah, that's really a fascinating area. And my book does deal a lot with that because as you say, you begin with um, the VC having a lot of power because the entrepreneur is doing hardware, that's capital intensive, you need a lot of money. When the money is needed in large amounts, the money provider, the VC, tends to have a lot of influence, right? And then comes along, you know, the software period, and then all of a sudden the entrepreneur doesn't need 
all that much capital. And so the terms of the negotiation change and the VC has less power. And so then this reaches this sort of apotheosis, as you were saying, with founders becoming kind of imperial. Um, they not only want to keep most of the company themselves, they also demand that their shares should have these super voting rights, as you said. The tipping point came with Google, um, which was smart enough, A, to force the venture capitalists to cough up a lot of money um, and get rather a small share of the company, uh, but also then uh, in the flotation uh, demanded that these um, super voting rights be awarded to the founders. Uh, and that then got taken further and further and Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg basically calls all the shots because he kept control. And it, it ends up in, in situations where I think the founders face no check, no balance, and just at the point where, you know, they've created a unicorn and they're feeling, you know, naturally kind of proud of themselves, um, they need to be a little bit subject to checks, right? If you are running a public company worth a billion dollars, and remember Amazon went public way before it reached that valuation, uh, you know, if you messed around too much, the uh, stock holders, the equity holders in the stock market, they could just sell your stock. And, you know, at some points in, in its trajectory, Tesla has faced that, um, or the SEC has come after Musk, you know, for saying there was going to be a takeover and then there wasn't, and, you know, misleading investors and all that stuff. So when you're a public company, there's a discipline on the CEO. When you're a private company, if the CEO is also the founder, is also the main shareholder, is also the super voting shareholder, there's no check and no balance. And if, if the founder is just a fantastic person, uh, and there are many cases of that, it's fine. But if the founder is a brilliant person but has flaws, which is only human, then you have Travis Kalanick at Uber, right? Who was a fantastic early stage entrepreneur, built the business brilliantly, but at a certain point he needed to grow up, he needed to build a, a mature organization. And instead he allowed a kind of disastrously ill-disciplined culture to spiral off the, off the moral rails and almost destroyed the value in Uber because because he he wasn't he wasn't being checked by an investor who had the power to check him. It seems so. Like a real, oh, sorry, you, maybe just one more thing on that. So you you asked me where are we on that? I hope there will now be the pendulum swinging back as we move towards uh, hardware again, and it's not just a software story. And as people learn the lesson from things like Uber, maybe the venture capitalists will have a bit more power. What's interesting here is, as you established, though, the, the metric here, if you're a VC firm, is not pure societal good. It's it's getting the grand slams. What I'd wonder is, at that grand slam 0.01 performance level, which approach do you think has borne out better fruit? Founder-centric approach or the VC-centric approach? Obviously, we're comparing different eras, so maybe a better way to phrase the question, if you would have an answer to it, would be during this post-2008 period, did firms who had more founder control with those super voting shares tend to produce better returns than those that didn't? Because it's a quick anecdote here, but I think it's really important to add here is that everyone, for a variety of good reasons, will critique Mark Zuckerberg. But the early story that I always find so fascinating and revealing is that famously, other than Mark Andreessen, initially, everyone wanted Mark Zuckerberg to sell Facebook to Yahoo for around a billion dollars, which would have been in the long term, a terrible decision, most likely. Yahoo is, um, aside from, I'm a, I'm a you know, happy Yahoo on board and beyond the internet, but it wasn't a company that was very successful at actually running its acquisitions. So Mark Zuckerberg famously decides, even Peter Thiel wanted him to sell, he decides, no, I'm the founder, we're going to continue. So I think that is an important anecdote of there actually being, at least at a narrative level, some sort of real heft to the idea that the founder in certain contexts can make those proper decisions. How How is this really, at a pure returns level, how has this played out, do you think, over the past 10 years? So the first thing to say is that there is no kind of hard empirical answer because what's going on here is that the founders who do really well in the last 10 years or so have gotten super voting rights, kind of almost just as like a, you know, if you do really well, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if you're the founder, you're not going to say no to that. Of course, you like having the power. So it's like, you know, the, the doing well drives the super voting shares and therefore you can't you know, do the do the mental exercise the other direction. You have to sort of imagine a counterfactual because there isn't a real one. Mm -hmm. I would I would say that, you know, so I, first of all, I'd say that the kind of fashionable popular line of argument in the Valley in the last five years has been, you know, the founders should have control and that's how you get the best returns. Um, and part of the argument is plausible. So the argument would be, you know, you have an exceptional person who drives the company in its early stages. Why would you question success? And they may be doing some crazy stuff, but doing crazy stuff can be essential to making the company great. Um, I, I do admire Mark Zuckerberg, not only for the early thing of refusing to, to be sold to Yahoo, but also, you know, it, it, it's, it's impressive that he's pivoted his company repeatedly. So, you know, he begins with Facebook, the actual Facebook, then he buys, you know, Instagram and WhatsApp, which took some guts. Then he starts moving into things like Oculus uh, and doing hardware. Uh, and now he's renamed the whole thing Meta. Um, and, and so he's reinventing in a way. And there's an argument that says, um, if, if you were not the founder, you were just the CEO, you wouldn't have the guts to take something that you didn't yourself create and fundamentally reimagine it and sort of trash the old vision and say, no, we're going with a new vision. That kind of aggressive pivot may be necessary to survive in the long term in tech, but it, it, you know, psychologically, it might be easier for the founder to reinvent his or her own thing rather than just a CEO. So I, I've heard those arguments a lot. You know, I've been researching this book for five years and, um, and so I've, I've, I've been around this debate for a while. Personally, I'm not persuaded. And the reason I'm not persuaded is that I think if you frame the question as like, is it good for the VC to have more control in terms of voting rights and so forth? And to be you know, on the board and willing to challenge the founder, I can't see that that's a bad thing. I honestly think that everybody could do with an overseer, which has the power to actually challenge properly. And I'm not sure that um, Facebook's board has that power with Mark Zuckerberg and where he's made mistakes, uh, especially in terms of his political positioning and, and his sort of, his sense of ethics around, you know, privacy or addiction to the screen and all that stuff. I, I think that could have been changed if there had been stronger board members. Um, so, you know, if you do have strong board members, they tend to want the best thing for the company. And if the founders are doing everything right, they will let them go do it. But if they're doing something a bit dodgy, they'll at least ask questions. Uh, and I, I would say that would be more healthy. healthy. An interesting factor here when you understand the way that venture funds are structured is many times, especially during the software is eating the world era, arguments are made, and we'll, we'll link to Mark Andreessen's op-ed on the topic because it's a good explanation of the thesis, which is that tech and venture are challenging these legacy incumbents. So they're challenging higher, higher education, they're challenging the taxi industry, they're challenging government. But especially in the higher education space, what's interesting to me is oftentimes you have Ivy League schools like Harvard, non-IVs, but obviously Ivy tiers like Stanford, whose endowments are actually very tied up um, within, they are investing in these firms and then they're receiving these really bountiful, bountiful returns from that investment strategy. So it's a very effective one and I don't begrudge that. So what my question would be is to what degree are legacy institutions challenged by the future legacy, the, the future of venture capitalism funding? And to what degree are they able to use the fact that they still have power to effectively build the future still? So there's obviously the newspaper industry who blows this, but it seems like higher ed, at least at the top level, is someone who isn't. Sorry, so your question is about whether higher ed would be challenged or whether in general incumbents are going to continue it, to be challenged? At this, this is, yeah, thanks for helping me refine. What I would say, here, the simpler version of the question is, it seems as if at this stage, 
in the internet and technology's development. So this isn't the 1990s, this isn't the 2000s, this is the 2020s. Legacy institutions with vast amount of capital who have survived internet disruption up until now are now in the position where they are able to reap the benefits of technological innovation mm. without fundamental disruption. For example, I speak to a variety of people on venture capital Twitter who will say that, for example, higher education is going to be disrupted by tech when it seems to me that higher education is actually, especially at the top two levels, is actually dominating the space because they invest in so many funds. So how do you think about yeah, yeah. this dynamic? That's a, that's a good thought. I hadn't actually um, had that thought myself ever. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you raise a good point that, you know, on the one hand, you know, tech is supposed to be disrupting higher ed. I mean, it seems like an obvious thing. And we've had various, um, you know, MOOCs and, and online education options attempt to do that. But at the same time, the incumbents, as you say, are reaping all this, this money from, from the proceeds from venture capital. My guess would be that um, no matter how much you reap in terms of limited partnership returns, um, because you know, you're know you Stanford or Harvard and you've got your money in Sequoia, um, it's not enough to protect you if there's really a, a sort of fundamental product market fit between a disruptive education startup and what society wants. I mean, I think the bigger protection for incumbent higher ed is probably some combination of brand and just the sort of, you know, it's a network. It's, it's not just an education. It's, it's a lifelong network, which people are really hungry to get into and they'll pay almost anything to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the endowment does shore up that position, but there's other stuff shoring it up as well. Eh? But anyway, you raise a great question. I'm not sure I have the best answer, but so yeah, two cents. The, the obvious other rebuttal to me is that framing the higher ed conversation around Harvard is simply sort of pointless. Right. There are 3,000 other schools, <laughs> a world where, yeah, yeah. you know, the tippy, 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 tip, tip top Ivy schools are fine is still a world that's significantly disrupted, especially at the, um, like, let's say, like second or third tier state school level. Um, so that's very fair. So what I want to get to here is what, let me put it this way. Let's focus on the disruptive nature then on the startup end. So your publisher actually described this book as a corrective to a lot of the Silicon Valley tech backlash. So let's put some meat on the bones there. What would you say a lot of the backlash against tech gets right? And then what does it get wrong that you're giving a slightly different perspective on? Look, I think that the big um, tech giants – uh, like any big company, are going to have enormous social effects and some will be good and some will be bad. And I think the bad stuff needs to be regulated. And so, you know, I'm concerned about what Facebook does to public debate. Um, I'm concerned that it can be used by Russian hackers to spread lies about American democracy or about, you know, promoting vaccine hesitancy. Um, I'm con I to be honest, I'm less personally concerned about um, privacy because I think the revealed preference of folks is that whenever they're asked to click on something saying, we'll give you this service very efficiently, but you just have to allow us to monitor you, uh, people tend to be okay with that almost always. So I think privacy may be something I'm less worried about than other people, uh, but I am worried about screen addiction um, and I'm worried about monopoly power. I mean, to the extent that you know, Apple um, is, is charging app developers 30% or whatever it is to be on the store. Um, is that a fair price or is that a tax on innovation? Well, given the strength of the Apple ecosystem in terms of those platforms and reaching consumers, it's not clear there's enough competition for me to say confidently that's a fair price. I think it may well be overcharging. So uh, I, I think there is, there's definitely a role for government and society to push back against these very powerful companies. But what I think is important to keep sight of, and I think you know, the debate often misses, is that if you don't like big tech, you should really love small tech. In other words, venture capital-backed startups 
are part of the antidote to big tech. If you want to you know, disrupt a monopoly power of Google or Apple, then you should encourage startups that have a shot at, uh, at challenging them, right? Um, and I was struck, for example, you know, Tim Wu, who is the uh, Columbia professor who's now the top uh, tech um, antitrust advisor in the White House. He has he wrote a, a quick, small quick book. For the audience, he wrote Master Switch, which is an incredible book. Um, I really yeah. recommend it to people in the audience who are interested in this topic. Right. Um, so I read his most recent book. I think that's not Master Switch. That's another one. I forget the title. But anyway, it's a, it's a sort of 100-page statement of uh, his belief that we need to get serious about taking on the tech monopolies and, and, and you know, why antitrust was sort of hijacked by conservatives in his view uh, and the wrong tests were then applied and, and we've allowed these tech companies to get too big. Now, you know, as I've just said, I don't disagree that tech companies can be too powerful, but what's striking to me about Tim Wu's book is that, you know, I searched it, I had a digital version and I looked for the word venture capital, I think I found zero hits. I looked for the word startups and were kind of three or four mentions in passing. But the idea that, you know, part of the solution to his concern might be challenges from venture capital backed startups, apparently is not on his radar, which is amazing. Um, and so the corrective I'm hoping to offer with my book is look, look, you know, yeah, big tech might have issues, but small tech is part of the answer. So this is good. I'm glad you set this up this way because I can make the argument that Tim Wu should have made. And you hear this from senators such as Amy Klobuchar, which is that, um, Two arguments, and I'd like your response. Argument one, well, the reason why small tech isn't an answer to big tech is that venture capital funds will not actually fund challenges to incumbents like Facebook, Google, et cetera. They'll say, well, no one's, and actually, <laughs> I was going to say no one's funding a YouTube alternative, but that's actually literally not true. Rumble's being funded. So I'm giving my bias on this question, but so they say one no one's funding challengers because the challengers are so powerful, they can't be defeated. And then two, when they do fund challengers, they only fund the challengers so that they can be acquired by these same massive startups through aqua hiring and other such practices. So what are your responses to those two arguments which I've heard before? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of probably most famous case of this aqua hire um, idea is, you know, Facebook was worried um, that WhatsApp and Instagram presented challenges, so it bought them. Um, and, you know, therefore venture capital can never really challenge um, Facebook. So, I mean, I think the first thing to note about this example is that actually the mere fact that WhatsApp and Instagram got off the ground and presented a challenge shows that the first contention you just described is not true. Venture capitalists do back <laughs> challenges. Right, that's why they had to be acquired. Um, second point is that when WhatsApp gets acquired, I think it was a $13 billion price tag that um, Facebook paid for it. What incentive do we think that creates for venture capital partnerships um, in the future? They're gonna go and find more challenges um, to, to Facebook and maybe next time they won't sell, right? Um, and then, because the, as the, I say, the founders of WhatsApp are not particularly happy with how that deal turned out long term, which definitely serves as a, a precedent for people. Yeah, yeah, but you know, the venture capitalists are happy. They got thirteen billion, or they got their slice of the thirteen billion dollar bucks, right? I mean, Jim Gertz, who did that deal for Sequoia, was then not coincidentally uh, the number one venture capitalist in the world for four years in a row, I think, or three or four years on the Midas list at Forbes does. Yeah, mostly because of that deal. So, I mean, it's a super big incentive for VCs to go off and fund other challenges. But the other thing I think is, is sort of on the specifics of the deal. I mean, there's um, a good book about Instagram that goes into the thinking that the founders of Instagram had as they just face that decision. Do we sell to Facebook or not? Yeah, this, is, uh, no, this is No Filter by Sarah Freer. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, well done. Um, uh, she describes, uh, and I was intrigued by this, so I emailed with Sarah afterwards. She describes the um, decision process that uh, Instagram went through as being you know, not a foregone conclusion. 
you know, they realized, they understood, of course, that if they refused the offer from, from, from Facebook, Facebook would compete very hard with them. Uh, and that would be tough. But it wasn't like they had to take the deal. They were kind of thinking of not taking it. I think their main VC backer was surprised when they decided to take the deal. So, in fact, you know, startups do sometimes turn down acquisition offer. And, uh, you know, of course, as you said before, Mark Zuckerberg is an example himself. So we've got two last sections here in these last 15 minutes. So I want to hit them. We, we made reference, a casual reference to Web3, um, something we've covered a little bit on the show here, which is effectively either technological change, but it's also a different specific uh, delineation of a different era of tech. So you have Web1, 1990s, Web2, which is effectively... 2004-ish to basically the present, and then Web3 is this more hypothetical space. Um, you describe Web1 as selling stuff, Web2 as creating networks. You said there's a lot of flim-flam when it came to Web3, but what, what do you think is the prompt? What, what excites you? Or what should excite an a venture? The, the venture capitalists who are pouring a lot of energy and money into the Web3 space, what are they excited about right now? Gosh, I think there's, you know, there's a, a certain amount of excitement, which is sort of in the category of, gee, everybody else is excited about this. So we can make money by providing stuff that they need. So whether that's a new kind of wallet to hold your NFT in, or whether it's the NFT itself, or whether it's some new token, um, all of those kinds of plays, um, and it could be, of course, you know, new types of semiconductor that make Bitcoin mining uh, faster and more effective. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of stuff that come out of the existing commitment that the community has to this area. Um, and, and that's what I would regard as, you know, a bit speculative because, you know, if the interest were to go away, then, you know, you'd be left with nothing. But it's a pretty strong speculation. You know, these things reach a kind of critical mass and, and it's hard to undo the critical mass. I mean, to be honest, um, my view of Bitcoin is that there was never one good argument for Bitcoin, uh, but different constituencies had reasons to like Bitcoin. You know, the coding community thought it was cool code. The libertarians thought it was a way around the government. People from Argentina wanted to remit money to their family using this. Criminals wanted to do Silk Road and, and sell illegal stuff on it. And then, you know, entrepreneurs saw all this going on and they said, hey, let's build a wallet or let's build something. You know, so, so cumulatively, these different constituencies created something that has now been around for more than a decade. And I don't think it's going to go away. So it wasn't logical, but it's happened. And now it's sort of sensible to invest in, in wallets and all that because I didn't I think it's sticky. Then there's a different part of Web3, which I think is really the more exciting part, which is kind of about taking the capability to do decentralized blockchain-based um, computing and uh, building applications on top of that, which probably allow more consumer ownership of data, um, more portability, uh, and you know, maybe build the future web less around the platform providers and more around the ability of individual consumers to have their data kind of distributed on a, on a decentralized ledger where, where they really feel like they've got it forever. Because I think one thing that does bug people, um, and I would include myself here, is it's not so much I worry about privacy, it's more that I don't like the idea that my data could just be frozen or taken away, or I might be prevented from transporting, you know, let's say a new rival to Twitter comes along and I've got a few years of tweets, which for some reason I, I hold sentimentally dear to me. I'd like to be able to port those tweets onto, my, onto the new uh, platform that I prefer to use in the future. And I think Web3 holds that promise um, and then on top of that, there's all the kind of virtual reality, artificial reality, headset technology that sort of builds on top of that, um, which I think is going to be, I mean, I've, I've demoed some of that stuff 
it's pretty early stage, I would say, but I think it's in the end, it's going to be real. And a quick question here before we get to the final China section. What do you think about Jack Dorsey's arguments about Jack Dorsey's pushing post Twitter? Jack Dorsey is pushing back against a lot of the Web3 hype by arguing that much of the talk of decentralization and user control is effectively negated by the fact that venture capitalists in their very centralized manner have invested significant amount of monies amount of money into these supposedly decentralized platforms what do you what do you think about that because once again this is also early days so it's hard to be empirical but what do you just think about that specific conflict and argument yeah i, I would say that the the issue is a little i mean i i would put it a little bit differently i don't think it's the problem comes from venture capitalists because the venture capitalists are delighted to make money by moving with the grain of the technology, they don't need to go against it. So if the technology turns out to be really pushing us in, a, in this decentralized ledger way, they're going to figure out how to make the best semiconductors that power that stuff, the best batteries, the best servers, the best cloud technology, the best security around it, whatever, the best interface for consumers. They're going to be fine, right? They're going to adapt. I think the bigger question about this sort of post-corporate vision for Web3 is that, you know, the limited liability joint stock company has been around since sort of 1867, I think. It's been a pretty efficient way of organizing human activity, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea that the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, is going to supplant it, I think is a stretch. I mean, I think there just is value in the way that companies organize people and talent and resources and have a sense of mission. Uh, and, you know, as you know, at the beginning of the web 1.0, there was this vision of a sort of post non-corporate internet and that proved to be completely wrong. I wouldn't be surprised to find corporations playing a very big role in the web three. I'm sure they will. Mm. I don't think DAOs will be as powerful as corporations. But I do think that the corporations may be kind of forced to adapt to some element of this decentralization. And it will be a different, Web3 will be different to Web2 in a way that we don't exactly know yet, um, even if VCs and corporations, as Jack Dorsey is saying, continue to play a big role. Yeah, just my last thing here is basically that I, something I'd be curious for more analysis around is, because it seems to me the ultimate case, it seems to me DAOs are actually making an ultimate case against the cult of the founder um, in a certain way. And what I've been frustrated when I've spoken with people who are in the DAO space around is I haven't seen a strong argument that that type of decentralized decision-making is inherently better than more central at, at, at a pure decision-making level, separate from almost philosophical level. So that's a, that's a place which I'd like to see more work on. Let's, let's finish with this question, which is you, you really wrap with this emergent dichotomy between the way the United States is pursuing um, technological innovation and its technology industry um, with how China's approaching it. Because earlier in the episode, you specifically stated we – believe that innovation works in this decentralized manner, this, 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 and that. China very clearly does not believe that. They're taking a completely different approach. So I'd love for you just to close with as, as, as long a you know uh, discourse as, as, as you can give on, A, the misconception that at least at initial stages, China's venture capital and technology industry was different than the American one. And then B, where the split is actually occurring right now and what the risks to China's technological innovation are contained within that split. Yeah, that's a great way to end actually, because you know one of the arguments that I, I, I make about Silicon Valley, uh, which I, I kind of semi knew I was gonna make as I got going, although it became deeper, is basically that tech clusters like Silicon Valley, you know, the venture capitalists are really at the heart of it. They're the ones who create the network because it's their job to be meeting people all the time to find the next deal, to be meeting more people all the time because they got to hire five new engineers to go in the company they did the deal on last week, uh, to be meeting even more people because they got to find the customers for their portfolio companies, 
and to be thinking about ways that two of their portfolio companies could collaborate or, you know, so they're constantly circulating in the network. And that's what moves ideas and talent and money around the ecosystem. And that's what makes it creative and productive. And that's why Silicon Valley has done better than any other ecosystem uh, thus far uh, because of West Coast venture capital. Okay, so that's the argument I make about, about the West Coast. What I was stunned by, stunned, is that when I went to research uh, China and the origins of Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Sina, Sohu, NetEase, all these early Chinese um, uh, internet companies, is that the origin story is exactly the same. I mean, it's unbelievable. I thought, you know, I would go to China and I'd find it was different, that this is a, you know, state capitalist model uh, with a powerful government kind of directing everything. The truth of the matter is that, you know, Chinese tech policies, government tech policy, uh, around the time when Alibaba and Tencent got started, was we want semiconductors, right? They were putting their energy into building a semiconductor sector. And as we know today, they failed. The US semiconductor sector is way stronger than the Chinese one. What the government also did in the meantime was to say, you know, consumer portals like the Yahoo of China, who cares? I mean, who cares? They just were completely not interested. And so they vacated that space and the vacuum was filled by Western venture capitalists. Sometimes they were operating out of surprising places like uh, I, I profile uh, Shirley Lin, who was the youngest woman partner at Goldman Sachs uh, and who pioneered venture investing in, in China. She's a Taiwanese American and she put the first money into Alibaba. Um, but in other cases, there were other US-based venture partnerships. IDG, uh, for example, was uh, involved, in, I think was behind Tencent. Um, another one was behind Baidu. And, and all these different early Chinese internet companies had in one form or another uh, Western venture capital. And what that meant was that they could also have a, a structuring that brought the Valley toolkit uh, to China. So, you know, they, you know, Silicon Valley lawyers showed up and they structured the deal documents so that you could have different kinds of equity, preferred stock for the venture investors and equity options, very importantly, for the uh, star employees. Now, remember, this is like the late 1990s. There was almost no equity culture in China. The, the Shenzhen and, and Shanghai stock exchanges were only created in 1990, right? So mm -hmm. any kind of equity is a new idea. Equity options didn't exist. There was no Chinese translation for it, right? So this is a radically new idea which the American VCs brought to Alibaba. And when Alibaba got these equity options, they turned around and used them very aggressively. So, you know, they hired Zhou Tsai, who became the kind of business chief, kind of Jack Ma's counterpart, who was this, um, you know, Taiwanese American, Yale educated lawyer, he'd been at Sullivan and Cromwell, a completely Western figure, really, um, who goes into Alibaba and is sort of the business leader that, that helps it to grow. Then they want to beef up their engineering team. They go to John Wu, who is a Chinese American living in Silicon Valley, who is the lead engineer at Yahoo. And they woo, they woo John Wu, <laughs> they hire him um, uh, by giving him a lot of equity options. And then they give him more equity options so he can hire an entire team of, of engineers based in Silicon Valley, but coding on behalf of Alibaba. So I firmly believe, I didn't know any of this before, but I firmly believe as a result of this research that Alibaba, it's not a stretch to say, would never have become a world-class company if it couldn't have hired these world-class employees really early on. And so it's venture capital that made that possible. And you can retell the same story basically with all these other early Chinese startups. And you can also tell the story, like as the Chinese ecosystem matured, you know, I was telling a story from like 1999, 2000, you can fast forward to around 2010, 2015, and see the way that as the VC ecosystem in China matured, and it become more Chinese led, it was still really guiding uh, the formation of Chinese digital companies. So the famous merger between Meituan and Dianping, which created one of the biggest Chinese uh, internet companies of all and, and avoided a kind of bloodbath of competition when these two companies uh, were kind of tearing each other's eyes out. That was facilitated by Chinese investors. 
Um, so uh, it, it really has been an American style VC led digital economy story until just recently. Mm -hmm. And what's happened recently is, as you know, the government's come in and cracked down and basically imposed government control on, on the Alibabas and Tencents of this world. And some people see this as the sort of enlightened Chinese state um, bringing guidance to the tech behemoths there in a way that American regulators would wish they could do. You know, we don't like screen addiction in the US. Well, in China, they just ban it. They say, you know, if you're a Chinese teenager, you can only do whatever it is, you know, a few hours of, of screen time a week and that's it, you're, you're done. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that power in the US. And so some people regret that. But my feeling is that if you go into China, uh, I mean, if you, if you go into Chinese internet companies as the Chinese government and you play too much of a heavy hand of the big state, it's going to fundamentally mess up the incentives and the Chinese venture capital machine, which has really been behind the digital economy progress, will start to lose energy. It won't happen overnight, but I think in a sort of medium term view, it means that uh, China is going to slow down in digital economy terms. And the kind of new player to watch instead is going to be Europe. That's a really interesting place to leave. Sebastian, thank you so much for joining. This has been like really helpful. This is coming out the day of book launch, obviously. So I suggest that everyone check out Power Law, but also More Money Than God and The Man Who Knew, who really fit, like you said, into this really strong, strong, just broader approach to the financialized economy. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Marshall. Great to be with you.